My name is Alexander van der Putte at uh, the AIFC. I have multiple roles, but I will only cite two. Uh, one is obviously that I'm here on behalf of the Academy of Law, where I'm the chairman of the Academic Council, but I'm also the chairman of corporate governance and stewardship at the AIFC. Uh, during the short discussion that, uh, that I had with Professor Moore and with David, I said that uh, some professors are a little bit nutty. I'm not referring to Professor Moore here. I'm prefer referring to myself. Right. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I said, well, when, when I was reading to Professor Moore's biography, I said, why don't I draw parallels with my family? <laughs> and, and here it is. So um, first of all, I do have lawyers in my family, although I'm not a lawyer myself. And, uh, and interestingly, and you probably have heard of him, Eric Holder is actually my wife's uncle. <laughs> now, there are other parallels as well with my family. And um, Professor Moore is the chair in corporate uh, and financial law at University College London. And currently, my oldest daughter, he's, she is a, an exchange student from, from Harvard studying psychology. So uh, yet another parallel. <laughs> and then finally, um, Professor Moore is a reader in corporate law and director of the Master in Corporate Law program and Center for Corporate and Commercial Law at the University of Cambridge. That was obviously previously. And, and as I mentioned to Professor Moore earlier, I'm an alumni from uh, Cambridge University, something I'm actually very proud of. Now, for the audience, um, what is a reader? What does that stand for if you compare to the American system? It is actually very similar to a professor, but without being a chaired professor. Uh, in the United Kingdom, we have four levels, where in the US we have three levels, lecturer, senior lecturer, reader, and professor. So uh, you can actually interpret this as a professor without having the official title of a professor if we look at the analogy with the United States. Now, this is not about my family, of course. This is about you as the participants and obviously uh, Professor Moore, who has a long history of advising us and, and the court, the AFC court and also AFSA, our independent regulator on matters related to legal compliance, but also uh, well, insolvency, which is something that is quite important right now, uh, given COVID-19. And, and actually, AFSA is actually looking into potentially changing some of the insolvency regulations as well, mm -hmm. in order to avoid that companies are actually going bankrupt. And the Institute of Directors in, in the United Kingdom, they've done exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. They actually argued with the government in order to change the insolvency rules because otherwise we, we would see a lot of especially small and medium-sized enterprises uh, going overboard and potentially face bankruptcy and with the social and economic cost that uh, comes with it. So what will Professor Moore talk about today? This is the last lecture on future resolution and remedies. And more specifically, he will be talking on, and he will provide an introduction to the AIFC business law and practice. I already mentioned that we have an independent court and also an international arbitration center. And these are both under English common law. And that's important. Is it English or British common law? What do you say? It's British common uh, law, we right? See, we see English common English? law because yet yeah, Scotland, mm -hmm. where I'm actually from originally, has a civil law system. <laughs> Uh, so we are more like continental so, Europe. Uh, English common law. Yeah. Professor, I'll hand to Professor Moore, who is going to engage you on dispute, uh, dispute resolution and remedies. Professor Moore, it was a pleasure introducing you and I'm sure you're gonna have big impact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. It was a, it was a pleasure to be introduced by, by yourself. It was an honor. <laughs> uh, I probably am likewise a, a nutty professor, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'll try and be as sensible as possible for, for this hour. 
Uh, and it's certainly a small world uh, here in some of these links that we that we have together. Uh, now, this is, uh, as, as Alexander said, this is the final talk in this series. Uh, thank you for staying with me for the, the distance over the past four weeks. Uh, this is also, I should admit, the, the, the session that in a way I feel least comfortable presenting because I'm not personally a practitioner in the AIFC. As Alexander says, I've been heavily involved with the AIFC and with the AFSA over the past few years, uh, but uh, I'm not a practitioner myself and I'm speaking in a way as an outsider and I'm aware I'm speaking to people who do practice within the AIFC. So some things I may tell you, I feel I feel rather like I'll be preaching to the choir in a way, telling people things that many of you already know. But hopefully I'll be able to add some insights uh, as an English lawyer, uh, uh, just, just, just to provide more context to some of the dispute resolution mechanisms and remedies available in the AIFC. Uh, also extremely interesting to hear what Alexander said about the AI, AFSA currently consulting on changes in their insolvency laws, uh, which is, 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 as you mentioned, is something that we've recently been doing here in the UK. And that's something I'll be very keen to keep an eye on to see how, how that develops uh, over the, the next few weeks or so. Uh, so dispute resolution, what can we say about that? Well, just to begin, just to say a little about the jurisdiction of the AIFC court, uh, what disputes are covered by the AIFC court? What disputes does the AIFC court have the, 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 the jurisdiction or power to, to, to preside over? So uh, there's a range of, uh, of different disputes that are covered. There's one or two that are of particular interest to me as an outsider, as an English lawyer, looking at the AIFC from the outside uh, as, a, as a possible jurisdiction for, 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 for dealing with disputes. Uh, obviously, more internal issues are covered, disputes between AIFC participants and bodies, or uh, any dispute as regards operations carried out and regulated by the law of the AIFC. Uh, what's of particular interest to me, and this is why I've highlighted it on the slide as the third point down, uh, the AIFC court has jurisdiction over any disputes that are transferred to the court by the agreement of the parties. And that's irrespective of whether or not parties are registered in the AIFC. So what's of particular interest to me as an outsider, as an English law outsider, is this opportunity that the AIFC court presents for parties to basically choose it. Uh, so when they're writing a contract, they can put a particular provision in their contract, uh, which we would commonly know as a, which we would commonly call a forum selection clause. And by virtue of that forum selection clause, the parties can agree that the AIFC court will become, uh, will, 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 will be the court that will deal with any dispute that arises in respect of that transaction. The AIFC court also has jurisdiction when it comes to interpreting AIFC acts. And as a corporate lawyer, that's also something of particular interest to me, because of course a company registered in the AIFC will be subject to AIFC company law and potentially AIFC insolvency law as well. Uh, therefore, obviously, interpretation of those acts falls within the jurisdiction of the court. And as I've explained before a number of times in these talks, AIFC acts do not exist in a vacuum. They do not exist in an empty space uh, because ultimately in interpreting those acts and applying those acts to individual cases and also in filling the blanks and filling in issues that are maybe not quite comprehensively covered by the acts, courts will have regard to common law cases, they will have regard to English case law in, uh, in, in interpreting these acts. So when we say interpretation of AIFC acts, we don't just mean interpretation of the acts themselves, we also implicitly mean interpretation of all the case law, uh, the English case law and to a lesser extent the Commonwealth case law, which helps to explain how those acts apply. 
The AIFC court, I should add, has no criminal jurisdiction. It's only civil disputes. Uh, so criminal cases uh, naturally remain the domain of the relevant national courts. Uh, and also AIFC court decisions are final and not subject to further appeal. I should add the AIFC court can function as a court of appeal. It can function as a court of appeal in respect of decisions of certain other AIFC bodies. But as regards its own decisions, the court's own decisions are final, so there is no further right of appeal in respect of those decisions themselves. And of course, the AIFC court may decline jurisdiction. It may say that actually it does not feel it's got jurisdiction to hear a particular matter, or alternatively, may refer a matter to the domestic Kazakh courts if it feels that's more appropriate. Uh, and what powers does the AIFC court have? Well, in short, the AIFC court has got the same range of powers that we would expect from a standard common law court. Uh, an English court, in general, a common law court, the court of a common law jurisdiction, has got the power to do more or less anything to achieve a suitable, appropriate resolution of the case at hand. So, uh, under, uh, uh, under Section 27 of uh, the AIFC court regulations, which I think, did I cite them earlier? I don't think I've cited them, but under Section 27 of the AIFC court regulations, the court has the power to take all steps that are required or expedient for the proper determination of a case. Uh, so the court has basically got a range of different remedies and orders at its disposal to achieve what it deems to be the just or fair outcome to the case at hand. Now, there's a number of remedies that are available. Uh, significantly, one thing common law courts are very good at doing, I'm not saying civil law courts are not good at doing it, but my familiarity is more with the common law courts. One thing that common law courts are very good at doing is, uh, is making preliminary or summary orders for what in, in England we would call interlocutory judgments. Now, what that basically means, a, a, a summary or a preliminary order is an order that a court makes on the basis of pre-trial arguments. So you may want resolution of a particular legal dispute uh, and or, or, or you may want clarification of a particular issue that's being disputed between the parties, but you do not want to go to the expense and the cost and the time of having a full trial of the facts, where all the evidence is brought forth, witnesses are examined, etc. So what you can potentially do is get a summary judgment, a summary order in respect of a particular issue. Uh, well, without having to go to full trial or pending full trial. Also, if it's a particularly commercially sensitive matter, for example, it could be a takeover bid or a merger that's in the course of negotiations, and an issue needs to be settled in real time. Now, if we wait for the issue to go to trial and the facts, it could be many days, uh, sorry, it could be many weeks, potentially many months down the line before the issue is fully resolved. Now, the advantage of having an interim order is the court can make a temporary order. So, for example, it could place a temporary injunction on a particular act or proposed course of action, pending resolution of the issue at full trial. Uh, now, there's, there's a range of orders, remedies that a court can make, whether on an interim or summary basis or after full trial of the case at hand. Some of them are obvious. So, for example, a damages award would be a very common civil remedy, not just in a common law system, in any system, in civil law systems as well. Uh, now, if a damages award is made by any court, including the AIFC court, uh, that uh, amount, the amount of damages that the defendant is ordered to pay, will be deemed a debt due and payable. So, once uh, so, 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 so basically, an action, so, so if they fail to pay uh, the amount of damages that is due, 
an action in debt can potentially be brought against them to recover that sum. Other orders available uh, include injunctions. So if, for example, uh, there is, uh, to, 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 to take a possible example, let's say that a, a company that's registered in, in the AIFC is subject to a takeover bid and the board of the company are trying to defend against the bid because they don't want the company to be taken over and they engage in certain action that's deemed improper. Uh, for example, maybe they try to issue shares to associates as a way of trying to dilute the bid, which you're not allowed to do under, uh, un certainly under under AIFC and English law, you would you would not be allowed to do that. Uh, well, one thing that uh, uh, that, that uh, the, the 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 prospective bidder could get to try to deal with this issue is they could apply to the court for an interim injunction. Therefore, the court, on the basis of the arguments that are brought forth, uh, could make an interim, injun an interim injun injunction in a summary hearing, which provides an immediate resolution. Perhaps the matter could then be settled at full trial. More likely it won't be, because if the injunction is made and the moment passes, the bid most likely won't happen. Uh, so uh, injunction can, in many situations, be a more appropriate remedy than damages because it deals with the issue in advance. It stops the problem from occurring, whereas a damages award is naturally backward looking. The harm has already been caused and the court's job is just to try to clear up the mess afterwards. Uh, and that's generally not the best option uh, for, for, for any party. Other things, other remedies available at common law include something called specific performance. Uh, this is what's known as an equitable remedy because historically it was created by a separate branch of courts known as the courts of equity in England. Although the equity courts were merged with the common law courts around 150 or so years ago and now they just function as the one set of courts. But what that means is common law courts today can exercise a range of remedies which were traditionally known as equitable remedies. Equitable basically means the remedies that are there to try and ensure fairness is done in the facts at hand. And one example of an equitable remedy is called specific performance. So that means if I make a promise under a contract to do something, let's say for example we enter into a contract for the sale and purchase of an asset and I agree to sell that asset to you. Well, uh, if I subsequently turn around and refuse to sell the asset, perhaps because market circumstances have changed and it's no longer a commercially attractive deal from my point of view, uh, well, one option is you could uh, you, you could rescind the contract and claim damages. So you basically say, well, look, if you're not going to sell the asset to me, I'm going to pull out of my side of the bargain and I'm not going to pay you. I'll rescind the contract. And any damages that I have, in, I have incurred as a result of, of, of what's happened, I can then claim from you. But the other option that's available is to affirm the contract, to say, look, no, we are not walking away from the contract. A promise is a promise. You promised to sell me that land. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the court for a specific performance order, which is basically an order demanding that you fulfill your side of the bargain. In which case you affirm the contract and you ask the other party to perform. Uh, now there is a general obligation that, or a general duty that parties have at common law uh, in breach of contract cases to mitigate their losses as best as possible. So if it's possible to so, uh, if, for example, um, I'm, I mean, the, 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 the classic case to think of is a case called Ruxley and Forsyth, a classic English case from around 30, 40 or so years ago, Ruxley and Forsyth. What happened was a homeowner asked a builder to build them a swimming pool in their back garden. They specified the particular height of the swimming pool. Uh, I think it was to be four foot six inches, I think. That might be wrong, but it doesn't matter. There was a specific height. The, the homeowner said the builder must build the swimming pool to this particular depth. 
to enable them to swim in it. The builder built the swimming pool, but they did not build it to that depth. They built it to a slightly lesser depth. Now, the, uh, the homeowner basically asked the court for an order demanding that the builder fulfil the contract as originally planned. Essentially, I guess we could say it's a specific performance uh, remedy. Uh, and they demanded that the swimming pool be taken apart, essentially destroyed and rebuilt to a new depth, which would be the only way to ensure the contract was performed as promised. The court in that case refused to order the builder to do this on the premise that the benefits that the home that the home that the homeowner would get from 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 ordering this would exceed the huge costs of doing so. And the court said actually in a situation like this, the contractual party, the homeowner, has a duty to mitigate their losses. There's no denying the builders in breach of contract because they broke their promise to build the swimming pool to a certain depth. However, the, the other party to the contract is under a duty to mitigate their losses. Therefore, the court in this case came up with an alternative remedy. Basically, they, uh, uh, they, they, they affirmed the contract, uh, but they asked the builder to play a limited amount of damages to compensate the homeowner for their disappointment. But other than that, there was nothing further the builder was required to do. So specific performance is a limited remedy. It won't always be granted. It depends on whether it's reasonable and proportionate for the contractual party who is disappointed to actually use this, this remedy. Uh, other typical common law remedies available include, include declaratory relief. Declaratory relief, the third point from the bottom of the slide, this can be particularly convenient in cases of interim or summary judgments uh, because Declaratory relief, relief is basic, basically allows the court to make a ruling on whether something is lawful or unlawful so that the parties know where they stand. The court might not actually be giving a remedy as such. They might just be making an order on a particular point of law. A classic situation where we might see declaratory relief in a common law system would be in a case, where example, for example, where a director of a company or maybe a trustee was accused of breaching their fiduciary duties by acting improperly. Uh, so what, what, what may happen is the director or trustee may go to the court and they may ask the court effectively to strike out the claim, uh, to dismiss the action on the basis that they have no case to answer. And that would be on the ground that if the course of action, if the allegations that are being made against the defendant are substantiated are proved at trial, it wouldn't really matter because even if the allegations were proved, what the defendant has alleged to have done is not actually unlawful, it's not actually in breach of duty. So to clarify that issue, the director might apply to the court and apply for a basically declaratory relief for the court to say actually what you're being accused of having done is not unlawful, it would not be in breach of duty even if it was proved. Therefore, We'll, we'll basically dismiss the case and we won't proceed to trial. So that can be convenient and can be very cost effective, not just from the point of view of the parties, but from the point of view of the courts generally. Uh, other remedies available. Uh, one other remedy is restitution, the second point from the bottom. Very common remedy in, in common law systems. Restitution exists to deal with the problem known as unjust enrichment where a party to a dispute is left, uh, they are left with money or some benefit, some other benefit, which they've not obtained wrongfully, but nonetheless, it would not be fair to them to hold that benefit. So classic uh, situation of unjust enrichment actually arose in a case that, that uh, I was involved in dealing with last week uh, in London. Uh, where a company had tried to undertake a repurchase of its shares for which they needed to obtain 
a special resolution of their shareholders. The company failed to obtain a resolution of its shareholders, but proceeded with trying to repurchase its shares anyway. So it tried to repurchase its shares from an existing shareholder, and it gave that existing shareholder a very large amount of money as the consideration, as the price for their shares. Now, of course, it turned out in this case that because the share repurchase was invalid, it, in the eyes of the law, it had never happened. So the person who purportedly had their shares repurchased was sitting with the shares because their shares had not actually been sold because it was an invalid transaction. But in addition to having the shares, they also had a very large amount of money, which was supposed to be consideration for those shares. So that's a classic case of unjust enrichment. That person who the company thought was buying their shares, that person's not done anything wrong. They've not defrauded the company of that money. They've not obtained it wrongfully. If anything, it's a mistake of the other party, the company. But nonetheless, that person has been unjustly enriched. And therefore, uh, at common law, they would be liable to, to repay that money to the company. Uh, on, on, on what we would call a restitutionary basis. And a final notable remedy, this is not an exhaustive list I should add, this is just a selection of some of the main remedies available. Final remedy available at common law, uh, which also comes from the court's equitable jurisdiction, is something called disgorgement of profits. So this would classically arise in a situation where a, where a fiduciary Somebody in a fiduciary capacity, such as a trustee or an agent or a company director, had obtained a profit from their position, which they were holding improperly. So maybe, for example, a trustee had personally benefited from sale of trust property or had acquired money from the trust. Maybe a director of the company had diverted business from the company for his own personal uh, enterprise and was holding profits that were rightfully those of the company. Uh, or perhaps in an alternative scenario, maybe an agent or a director has obtained a, a benefit from a third party, such as a bribe, to induce them to award a contract, uh, which of course would be unlawful because it would put them in breach of the fiduciary duties to their, their company or their agent, sorry, or their principal if they're an agent. So. Uh, as they're in breach of duty, they would be required to what's called disgorge those profits. They would be required to give those profits up, and the court can make an order against them for disgorgement of profit. So there's a range of remedies available. Uh, where we're dealing with an equitable remedy, such as disgorgement of profit, uh, what, what's, what's quite crucial is rules of causation do not apply. Rules of causation only apply to traditional common law remedies like damages, for example. So if I am claiming damages, I, I need to show not just that a wrongful act has been committed, but also I need to show that I have suffered my loss or damage as a result of that act, that there is a chain of causation linking the act, linking the wrongful act to my damage. However, when it comes to equitable remedies, particularly disgorgement of profit, you don't, as a claimant or plaintiff, you do not actually have to show causation. So uh, if, for example, I'm a shareholder of a company and I feel the directors of the company have wrongfully appropriated business from the company, I don't need to show that had they not tried to steal that business from the company, the company would not have got the business anyway because the client didn't want to deal with the company. That's immaterial. I don't need to show that because causation does not apply because disgorgement of profits is what's called an equitable remedy. It's a remedy based on rules of, essentially rules of fairness rather than traditional law as such. Even though nowadays we would call all of these remedies essentially common law remedies. You know, some strictly are, are not quite legal in nature, they're equitable, which, is, which means a different thing. So that's essentially the powers of the court. Uh, what are the overriding objectives of, of court proceedings in the AIFC? 
Uh, many would see this as a self-evidently good objective, which is to enable the court to deal with cases justly. But just, justly, what's just or fair? It's quite a slippery term, quite an open-ended term. Um, you know, one person's understanding of justice might be another person's injustice. Uh, but helpfully, the AIFC court rules provide a more detailed definition of what they mean by dealing with cases justly. Uh, ensuring that the system of justice is accessible and fair, ensuring that parties are on an equal footing, ensuring cases are dealt with, dealt with expeditiously and effectively, using no more resources than are necessary, so not, not having long protracted cases where it's, it's not essential to do so, because ultimately it's costing the parties. And also dealing with cases in ways that are proportionate, to the amount of money involved, the importance of the case, the complexity of the issues, uh, and also the financial position of each party while making appropriate use of information technology. Uh, interestingly, uh, under the AIFC court rules, judges do not have to give their judgments in person uh, in Nurse Alton. So if they're not able to be in Nurse Alton to personally give their judgment, they can just provide their judgment in writing which also helps from that efficiency and that information technology point of view. And the parties have a duty to help the court achieve that overriding objective as well. So they do have to work to some extent in a spirit of cooperation, even though, of course, traditional court proceedings are fundamentally adversarial. There does have to be a base element of cooperation so that the system can work uh, in a functional way. Now, this is an important point, which is who bears the costs of litigation. Now, I do apologise because I'm not familiar with the, the national rules of the, 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 the domestic courts of Kazakhstan when it comes to costs of litigation. I'm only familiar with the AIFC rules, which mirror essentially the English rules. Uh, so I don't know how similar or different this is from your domestic courts in Kazakhstan. But the basic English law rule when it comes to allocating costs of litigation, uh, the, the, the basic English law rule is replicated in Kazakhstan. The default rule, the rule that applies unless the courts exceptionally say otherwise, is the loser pays rule. So basically, whoever loses the case pays not only their own fees and other costs, but they also pay the winning party's fees and other costs too. So that means that litigation in an English court is a, and in an AIFC court is typically very high risk. We contrast this, for example, with US courts. Uh, under US civil procedure rules, the default rule is that parties bear their own costs. So if you win the action, uh, you pay your own. Uh, sorry, if you lose the action, you pay your own costs, but you don't pay the winning party's costs. So that's not the case in England. In England, the loser typically pays everything. So you do have to be reasonably confident that you've got a good case if you're going to proceed to trial and you're going to proceed to judgment, because there's a lot to lose. Now, this is not a mandatory rule. It's not a universal rule. And the loser pays rule is subject to uh, variation at the discretion of the court. So the court may decide that costs are payable to some extent by both parties. They may also make an order as to the amount of those costs. In fact, they will invariably make an order as to the amount of costs uh, and also as to, to when costs are to be paid. As a general rule, costs of litigation should be reasonably and necessarily incurred and proportionate to the matter in issue. So if I'm suing you, let's say, in a breach of contract dispute for what really is a rather small sum of money. And in the course of trying to win my action, I employ teams and teams of expert witnesses and I run up huge, huge, huge litigation costs. And then I win the action and I demand that you pay me this limited sum of damages and all my huge litigation costs. Well, the likelihood in that case is the court will say, no, those costs were not reasonably and necessarily incurred. Therefore, 
we are holding the losing party liable to pay only a small limited proportion of those costs, which we think is reasonable. The rest of the costs would then be ordered to be borne by the winning party. So just because the loser pays rule applies as a default rule does not mean that you can then basically run up costs through the ceiling if you're confident of winning your case. It's not that straightforward because that, that wouldn't be fair on the other party. Now, one thing that has come into English law in, uh, in recent years over the course of the last decade is, is something called group litigation orders or GLOs. And group litigation orders are also available uh, in AIFC court litigation. Now, uh, many people in this country claim that the GLO is an English clash action. And there have been quite a lot of people celebrating, saying it's great that England now has class actions like the United States. That's not true. The GLO is not a class action. It looks a bit like a class action, but it's actually very different from a class action. Compared to an American-style class action, the, the English group litigation order really is quite limited. And I won't lie about that and make it into something bigger than it is. But it is, however, hugely convenient, particularly from an administrative efficiency point of view. Because what it means is, if you have a particular action, let's say, for example, you have a, a capital market or securities law action. So you have, let's say, for example, a, a, an AIFC registered company or a, an, an AIX listed company has made certain statements. Its, its CEO or its management team have made certain statements about the company's uh, actual or, or future earnings. And those statements, it turns out, have been based on false premises. Now, we may have, therefore, a misstatement. And that misstatement could potentially be actionable uh, because it's uh, either at common law as a misrepresentation or under statute. Uh, now, uh, the likelihood is if this is a publicly traded company, there will be a large number of investors. And hearing all those individual cases you know, on an individualized basis will be impractical. So what a GLO enables the court to do is to basically amalgamate all those cases essentially into the one action. Uh, now, that means that all investors who have been harmed or who, who allegedly have been harmed by the misstatement, their names will be put on a register and uh, then they can apply for removal from the register. But if they do not apply to be removed from the register, they will be deemed part of the group. Then that means if the court makes an, an, makes an order, for example, an order of damages payable to the group, they will be essentially bound by that order and they will give up the right to litigate the matter individually. Uh, now, you might think that's a class action because it does sound like a class action, but it's not the same thing for a number of reasons. The biggest distinction between an English or AIFC group litigation order and a US style class action is under English and AIFC civil procedure rules, there is no common pool system that I'm aware of. Now, what, what, what does this mean? Well, what it, what it essentially means is under US style civil procedure, un, under US style class actions, uh, there's something called a common pool system. So imagine you've got a thousand plaintiffs, to use the American terminology, a thousand claimants or plaintiffs who are all essentially claiming the same thing. They're all, they're all investors who claim to have been defrauded or misled through misrepresentations, misstatements, and they're claiming damages as a result. Now, under the US common pool system, the whole collective amount of damages that's payable to all those 1,000 claimants or plaintiffs all goes into the one common fund. And then 
all of the individual plaintiffs have got a right in turn to claim their share of that fund as damages. Now, what that means is, from the point of view of the, the lawyer or attorney who's representing the class, they, under the US system, are entitled to take a percentage share of the common pool as their fee before the, the, the various individual plaintiffs are paid. Now, in a typical US securities class action, the plaintiff attorney or lawyer would typically be looking to take a share of between 33 and 40 percent of the common pool amount. That would, a, a figure in that ballpark would typically be approved by a court as a fair award to the class action attorney, the plaintiff's attorney. So you imagine if you're the lead attorney for a class action in the US, and let's say we're dealing with a, a major publicly traded company, you know, that class action, let's say, could bring in $100 million of damages, or more likely it would be a settlement of $100 million. The securities litigation, like consumer litigation in the US, rarely goes to trial. Usually, the attorneys are looking to settle the matter out of court. And in the vast, vast majority of cases, that's what happens. So if, they, if the action settles for, let's say, $100,000, that $100,000 goes into the common pool or the common fund. The lead attorney can then claim their share, their fee from that as a percentage of the fund. So let's say they're given a 33 Let's say they're given a 35% a, a award, 35% of $100,000, sorry, $100 million, 35% share would be $35 million. So we're talking about quite a good payday for that particular lawyer. Now, there is no common fund or common pool system I'm aware of under English or AIFC law, which means uh, lawyers would not have a common pool of damages. To, to claim against. In a group litigation order, damages remain payable individually to the claimants who are part of the group, but there's no common fund. And typically under English law, under English civil procedure rules, the maximum amount that a lawyer is allowed to take as what's called a contingency fee. So if, for example, uh, a lawyer in England offers their services on a no-win, no-fee basis. The maximum they're allowed to take as their uptake in the event that the action is successful is a 100% uptake on their standard hourly fees. So you calculate the hours that you've done on the case, the hours that you've worked, your chargeable hours, and essentially you double them. That's the maximum you're allowed to take as your contingency fee. So it's a reasonably attractive fee, but it's nothing compared to the sorts of fees that US attorneys are taking in class actions, largely because we don't have the same common pool system for holding class damages. Uh, also bear in mind the implications of the loser pays rule in English civil litigation as well, because it makes it more difficult to operate a no win, no fee contingency system for litigation. Uh, because if you're a lawyer and you offer your services on a no win, no fee basis, uh, uh, under a loser pays rule, the loser would have to pay the winner's costs as well, which means as a lawyer, you would potentially be opening yourself up to pay the winning party's costs and it just would not be a viable arrangement. So the own cost rule, the US own the US real parties pay their own costs tends to be more amenable from the point of view of lawyers uh, making offers of contingency fee arrangements. Uh, other point to note that distinguishes group litigation orders from US class actions, which is specific to the realm of securities litigation, which is essentially investor or shareholder litigation. Uh, is uh, against against companies or their, their officers. Uh, in, in English law and by implication in AIFC law, 
there is no what's called fraud on the market presumption that is absolutely central to securities litigation in the US. And what this means is, imagine you have a large company which has got hundreds of thousands of different investors and the manager of that company makes a misstatement, makes a false statement, which indicates that the company is actually more successful than it, than it is. And that statement transpires to be false and a group of investors commence litigation to try to get damages for the lost value of their shares because they bought shares on the basis of this statement that's not true and they've lost money as a result. Now, it can be very hard to bring these actions. It's virtually, not completely, but virtually impossible to bring them uh, in England because of the need to establish causation. It's not impossible to bring these actions, that's not right, but in a very, very large company with a high number of investors, it can be virtually impossible because every single investor would have to prove causation. They would have to prove that they, uh, that they suffered loss as a result of relying on that statement. Now, with group litigation orders, that's a little less complicated because claims can be amalgamated so the same arguments can be used in respect of a number of different claimants however they would still have to establish causation now that's very hard to prove in any context particularly in the context of a capital market or a securities market where actually my decision to buy or sell shares in a company could well have been determined by a huge number of different variables of which the statement that that manager made is just one of them. Maybe I didn't even hear the statement. Now, what happens in the US is US courts, US federal courts, who deal with securities law disputes, they apply something called a fraud on the market presumption, which means that claimants or plaintiffs do not have to prove that they were directly misled by any statement that the managers or officers of that company made. All they need to show is that they relied on the integrity or accuracy of the market price, as long as they had no reason to suspect that the price they bought their shares for in the market was not a fair price, was not a fair, a, a fair valid price, then uh, they will be presumed to have relied on, in, they will be presumed to have relied on any communications, any statement that the relevant company or its officers have made. They don't need to prove that they've done so, which makes these actions considerably easier to bring. And that's why we, that's largely why we see so much securities litigation in the US, partly because of the common pool damages system and also partly because of the fraud on the market presumption, which we don't have in the UK and we don't have in pretty much all continental European jurisdictions. By implication, it won't apply in the AIFC uh, either, uh, because uh, there's no common law presumption to this effect in England. Uh, so, I mean, you know, many people think that Americans are somehow kind of socially or racially or culturally predisposed to, 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 to litigation that they're more litigious people by nature than others. That's nonsense, that's not true. The, the reason there's so much litigation in the US is because of their civil litigation rules, which are much more amenable to mass litigation than they are in most other jurisdictions. But if you brought those rules out in other jurisdictions, I'm sure people in those other countries would be just as litigious as Americans are. Uh, now, so far, I've really only spoken about formal court proceedings. And in the time I've got left, I would like to say just a little about alternative dispute resolution, or ADR, not least because under AIFC court regulation, section 25, the court are uh, required to encourage the parties to a case whenever possible to resolve their disputes by means of alternative dispute resolution. So they're at, the court are actually uh, required to encourage parties to settle their disputes out of court rather than in court. Court should necessarily be a last resort for the parties. Uh, and 
two main forms of, of ADR available, both of which are catered for extremely well in the AIFC, uh, are uh, arbitration and mediation. And I expect most of you will be familiar. Some of you indeed will be much more familiar in practice with these, uh, these processes than I am. So this is one area where I do feel I'm, I'm preaching to the converted in a way. Uh, so arbitration is the more formal of the two ADR mechanisms. Arbitration is closer to, to, to formal court proceedings in a way than mediation is, but it is essentially an out-of-court proceeding. Arbitration proceedings are typically agreed to by the parties uh, in their contract, and parties who agree to refer a dispute to arbitration will commonly also mutually waive the rights of recourse to the courts, which means they will agree to accept the arbitrator's award as a, sorry, the arbitrator's award as final and binding on them. And therefore they won't need to go, well, well basically they'll give up the right to go to court. They don't need to do that. They won't always do that. Sometimes arbitration can be followed by litigation but it depends on whether the parties have, uh, have agreed that or not. Uh, where an arbitration claim is served in either party to a dispute, uh, the, the AIFC court has a power to impose a stay or dismissal on legal proceedings. So basically they can make an order halting formal legal proceedings so that the arbitration can therefore proceed without fear that either party will, will, will call quit immediately and run to court again. And uh, where, whilst arbitration awards are typically made out of court, they are enforceable by the court. So the court can, can enforce an arbitral award. So uh, if uh, uh, an arbitral award is, uh, is, is obtained by parties uh, under the, uh, the IAC system, uh, the court, the AIFC court, can then be called upon to enforce the award if it's not subsequently honoured by the party uh, that it was made against. So with arbitration, typically there, there is a winner and a loser as such. Uh, it's just that the determination will be made out of court and not necessarily on the basis of the same set of formal legal rules or principles that the courts would use. Uh, arbitrators are commonly taken more from commercial practice than from a strict legal background. So from that point of view, the advantage of arbitration is the decision can be settled by people who are closer to the ground in terms of the relevant industry or market sector, that no market norms, customs, way of operating perhaps more closely than, than courts do. Courts are always that, that bit more detached from the action, so to speak. Now, mediation involves going further down the scale of formality. Mediation is less formal than arbitration. Uh, mediation typically does not involve a, a, a winner and a loser as such in the way that court proceedings or arbitration does. Whereas the arbitrator has got the power to impose a settlement on the parties, the mediator's role is essentially to facilitate parties reaching their own settlement via guided negotiations. So whereas court proceedings and to a lesser extent arbitration will commonly give rise to a win-lose outcome, somebody wins, somebody loses, mediation aims to provide a win-win outcome where both parties in some way can regard themselves as having a satisfactory outcome. Uh, unlike arbitration, mediation in general, well, this is partly true. Uh, since writing these lecture slides, I've had the advantage of, of, of having a discussion with Chris Campbell Holt, uh, who is the CEO of the, uh, the AIFC court. And Chris has filled me in on some of the, the more recent detail with respect to enforcement of arbitral and mediation outcomes in, uh, in the AIFC. So uh, when it comes to mediation, uh, well, first of all, with respect to arbitration, the AIFC is a party to the New York Arbitration Convention, the New York Convention on Arbitration, 
which means that uh, arbitral awards, uh, IAC arbitral awards, are enforceable internationally in other jurisdictions under the terms of the New York Convention. Also, under the Singapore Convention on Mediation, which the AIFC is also uh, subject to, uh, awards that are made uh, by mediators. So if a mediator uh, guides parties to a particular settlement, uh, the parties can agree that the settlement that they reach at the end of mediation will be enforceable in court, uh, in which case the AIFC court may ultimately be called upon uh, to enforce uh, the, 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 the settlement that's reached after mediation. And also, as a result of the Singapore Mediation Convention that I, men that I mentioned a minute ago, uh, the mediation settlement will also be enforceable in, uh, in foreign courts as well, in overseas courts, assuming the courts are in a jurisdiction that's actually also party to that convention. Uh, a dispute can be referred to arbitration in the event that the parties fail to reach a settlement in the event of mediation. And also in the AIFC, as Chris has helpfully informed me, uh, if the parties fail to reach a settlement in mediation proceedings, they can actually sidestep arbitration altogether and they can go straight from mediation to all out litigation and go straight to the court uh, if they so choose. So there's a range of options available going up that scale of formality of proceedings. So I've only got a few minutes left. Uh, I think this is actually the last point I wanted to make, which is, uh, no, sorry, this is the second last point. There's some general AIFC principles when it comes to arbitration. Uh, object of arbitration is to obtain the fair resolution of disputes by an impartial tribunal without unnecessary delay or expense. Arbitration and mediation are typically, generally, seen as as quicker, more efficient proceedings than uh, judicial proceedings, uh, not least because they don't involve judges having to trawl through the relevant law in the same amount of detail. Parties should be free to agree how their disputes are resolved, subject only to such safeguards as are necessary in the public interest, and also regardless to be had to the international origin of arbitration and to the need to promote uniformity in its application and the observance of good faith. That's provided for by the AIFC arbitration regulations. Uh, also, these are just some examples of model arbitration clauses, uh, which uh, I've taken directly from, uh, from AIFC documents. So this is an example of a, uh, of a classic arbitration clause that would be used in the event that parties wish to use the International Arbitration Centre, the IAC, uh, as, their, uh, as, as uh, their effective seat of arbitration. Uh, and uh, you can, I guess you can read that in your own time. Jeff, I believe, will circulate the slides uh, afterwards, so you will have the opportunity to see them. And also, just to, to follow that up, uh, there's, there's a further uh, clause which is provided as well by the IAC, which is a model mediation and arbitration clause. This is slightly abbreviated, so I certainly wouldn't copy this uh, by word to use in practice without consulting the relevant document itself, but it's just an example of if you want to make mediation available and also arbitration as a backup in the event that mediation fails to yield a settlement, that's how you might go about doing so through a clause of that nature. Uh, this, of course, being specific to the IAC. Uh, and just a final point to make, what are the advantages of ADR uh, as against formal litigation? And the optional reading I circulated, uh, the Richard Hill reading, tries to kind of cast some light on this. What are the key practical benefits? One of the main benefits of ADR is Whereas formal litigation is based on what the party's rights are, ADR is based less on rights and more on interests. ADR is more about trying to ensure that the parties, uh, 
uh, that 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 uh, the parties succeed in having their interests fulfilled uh, with the rules themselves being secondary to that. There's also additional advantages. Uh, ADR, especially mediation, typically facilitates information exchange. With mediation, parties are expected to be more forthcoming with information than they would typically be in formal litigation. Also, perhaps most importantly, mediation de-conflicts the parties, to use Hill's terminology. They're expected to switch from a zero-sum, I win, you lose mentality, to a mutual benefit mindset. How can we achieve an outcome that we both gain something from? And also, finally, there's more flexible range of potential solutions with ADR, and especially mediation. Because with mediation, the parties can potentially be guided to a settlement that neither of them initially expected or asked for, but which actually arises in the course of their subsequent guided negotiations. So that just provides a bit of context, a bit of background to a number of terms and notions that I'm sure most of you will already be familiar with to some extent. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for attending uh, all of my talks over these last few weeks. You have certainly kept me uh, in virtual company uh, during lockdown. This is one of the few bits of human interaction or you know, quasi-human interaction that I've got. Uh, I hope I've certainly enjoyed them greatly. I hope you've enjoyed them too. I hope to see you again soon. Please do uh, bear in mind uh, the legal training program I'll be running in September with the AISC court and IAC uh, corporate law. Uh, at the AISC court and IAC responding to the challenges of a post-COVID business landscape. Uh, so do please bear that in mind. I would love to see you there. Thank you to David for having me these last few weeks. Uh, thank you to Jeff and Almas as well for their, their help in putting these sessions together. And uh, yeah, uh, stay safe, keep well everyone. Uh, and uh, I hope you survive the rest of, of lockdown and uh, that we can all see each other properly sometime at the other end. So thank you. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Uh, Pro Professor Mark Moore, uh, please accept our heartfelt appreciation and gratitude for your fabulous set of four lectures on the topic of AIFC business law and practice. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. We look forward to your presentations at the courts uh, in September. Um, certainly, we uh, hope and assume that uh, they will be very, very well attended. Um, and on behalf of all of our stakeholders, uh, we look forward to that, as well as an ongoing long-term affiliation and collaboration sure. with you. And to our audience, um, please stay tuned. Uh, this was part of our webinar series. We hope it has been valuable to you. We have many more to come. Uh, certainly when this uh, COVID-19 crisis has subsidized a bit, um, or has mitigated, I should say. We will be offering a full range of online pre-recorded webinars, live interactive webinars like you've seen here uh, with Professor Moore. And we will be supplementing that with the traditional face-to-face uh, -face classroom type version and, and blended learning events and activities. So we look forward to your participation in all of those. We are publishing our uh, schedule on a regular basis. So please join. And just by way of, um, I suppose, wrap up as to what this session was about, you know, we very purposely devised this four lecture series on bus AIFC business law and practice with a specific intent in mind. And that is not necessarily to read from you, uh, read from the statute books of the AIFC what the black letter laws say about corporate law, about corporate finance and capital markets, about insolvency and restructurings and about dispute resolution. That information, those statutes and regulations are readily available, but instead we decided to step back a bit. We want to make sure that the AIFC legal jurisdiction, both from a transactional standpoint and from a dispute resolution standpoint, is accessible to a broad range of global legal practitioners. And that means those with common law, academic and experiential backgrounds. And it means those with civil law, academic and experiential backgrounds. 
Because this is a new jurisdiction, and because many of our participants are hearing some of this information for the first time, we very purposely wanted to focus on those foundational common law principles, theories, values, policies, and so forth, that really go into the development of the body of common law. So it's not only the statutory regime, it's this judge-made, case-made law that arises um, and, the, and the decisions that are made and the rationale underlying those decisions, well, that entire body of knowledge, if you will, becomes the common law and provides guidance for similar cases that have analogous factual patterns where this, these same statutes might apply to result in the resolution of, of uh, disputes. So we did that purposely. Uh, we will be make, making deeper dives into the AIFC regime. We'll be offering foundations programs, certificate programs, and the focus will be on both law and practice skills. So we look forward, uh, Professor Mark Moore, to um, uh, your continuing engagement with the AIFC. We appreciate it. And for those participants out there, stay safe and please join us again. Uh, we look forward to, uh, to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much.